Well, this is a classic situation where the host turns to the first speaker and says, shall we let our guests enjoy themselves for a while longer, or would you like to begin your remarks now? So I'm sorry to interrupt all the conversations going on, but uh, that's why we're here. And the secretary has graciously agreed to be with us for this time, so let's take advantage of it. So I want to thank Governor Fallon for agreeing to be our co-chair for today's plenary. And I will shortly welcome and also want to thank Secretary Shulkin, not only for his remarks, but also for agreeing to remain afterward to engage in a dialogue with all of us. I'm a little bit torn because I learned uh, just as we were walking in that he's a big Philadelphia Eagles fan who, yeah, there you go, Governor. Yep. Yeah, see? Well, I'm, get, I'm getting over it. But the Veterans Administration really needs no introduction, so uh, my, mine will be brief. The VA impacts the lives of our state's veterans in so many ways. And in addition to its vital services, the VA means something deeply special to our veterans. It's the fulfillment of a sacred promise that their country made to them. They step forward to protect and defend our country in a time of need. Some were fortunate to return relatively unscathed from their service. Many others, however, carry physical and psychic wounds which will plague them for the rest of their lives. Now they are in need. They need health care services, disability compensation, vocational rehabilitation, education assistance, home loans, life insurance, and even burial rights. How well the VA provides those and other services defines for them how well their country is upholding its end of the compact that they made when they were inducted. Well, Mr. Secretary, I'm sort of doing the introduction initially and then before I ask Governor Fallon to come up, but uh, I want to thank you and acknowledge the enormous responsibilities that you've undertaken to ensure that you're some 377,000 employees are providing the services that our 18.5 million veterans expect and, and believe they've earned, have earned, and believe they deserve. The Secretary's most annual performance plan report describes fiscal year 18 as, quote, a year of transition for the Department of Veterans Affairs. We have drafted a new strategic plan for FY 2018 to 24 that reimagines our relationship with veterans and how we serve them. Continuing the quote, as a result, the metrics we track and the targets we strive to achieve will change significantly in some instances. Well, that statement leaves much to the imagination and has triggered a multitude of reactions and overreactions. When I asked my Minnesota Veterans Organization leaders what I should ask the secretary, my number one response was, are you going to privatize the VA? So I hope uh, you, sir, will use this opportunity to provide a clearer picture of what you intend the VA to transition to, how it will affect the day-to-day -day inter interface that each veteran will have with your organization, and how it will improve the quality of services that they will receive. But first, let me turn it over to our co-chair, Governor Fallon. Well, thank you, Governor Dayton, and welcome to everyone. We appreciate you joining us here today for this very important discussion about our veterans in America and how we as governors and the public can better serve our veterans to make sure that they get the care and the services that they deserve. You know, the men and women that serve in our military put their lives on the line. They give up their holidays, birthdays, and births of their children, anniversaries. They miss all kinds of important events in their life. And of course, every time they put on that uniform and they go into harm's way, they put their lives at stake. And we owe them as a nation, we owe them as governors and, and as citizens of our state to take care of our veterans when they're finished with their service to our nation. Now, their service doesn't just stop and their harm's way doesn't just stop once a person leaves the battlefield. It also carries on once they're home. And many times there are many different issues that our veterans face that they need our help with. And we're looking forward to hearing 
Secretary Shulkin and his discussion about the administration's plans and certainly his plans as Secretary of the Veterans Department of how we can better care for our veterans and service their needs. Mr. Secretary, we're looking forward to hearing your comments about how we can improve the delivery of health care, how we can improve the delivery of cost that affects our states and our nations, how we can improve our infrastructure with our veterans' homes and the quality of care that they receive. We certainly are all faced with problems with homelessness among our veterans, with suicide prevention, which we all care deeply about, having the sufficient programs. Education and training is also very important to our veterans when they come home and if they enter into the private sector to be able to work and be able to find a job to support themselves and their families. And of course, just getting through the system, the timeliness of services and being able to wade through all the paperwork and all the different agencies that they deal with. Mental health services are certainly critical to our veterans and the care and treatment of issues that they may need some extra help with. And of course, we can't forget the families, the military spouses that transfer from the, the military service person to different communities and, and being able to find the right types of, of jobs and getting the licenses that they need. And in particular, I had the opportunity to talk with the secretary a few moments ago about substance abuse issues. I was telling him that we just finished a panel about prescription drugs and substance abuse issues many times over this course of this weekend. And I'm very encouraged that the Veterans Department and the Secretary is focused on substance abuse and veterans' courts and how we can help keep our veterans out of the criminal justice system by being able to divert them away from that through some substance abuse and treatment for some issues that they may have. So, Mr. Secretary, I know that our governors are willing and excited to be able to engage with you, to work with you. We want to take care of our veterans and give them the type of respect and care that they deserve in the service to our nation. So we appreciate you taking time away from your very busy schedule as Secretary of one of our most important departments in our nation. And we welcome to you to the National Governor Association. Please welcome Secretary Dr. David Shulkin. Thank you, Senator. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. And Governor Dayton, Governor Fallon, thank you for those comments. I, uh, appreciate it. And also, I think uh, I want to have a chance to just update you as, as both our governors have said, but we're going to have a chance to hear from you and some questions and some interaction, which I really look forward to. It's the way I learn best. Um, just this uh, past month, I had a chance to meet with your directors of your state veterans homes. And later on this week, I'm going to have a chance to meet with your state directors of veteran affairs. So the more interaction that I can hear and we have a chance to share about what's happening in your states and how we can better support you in both of our support of our veterans, it's really important. I always like to start with why we do this, and it really is our mission. As you probably remember uh, or have heard from history, right before his second inaugural address, President Lincoln gave the country this mission, that it really is our responsibility to care for him or her who have borne the battle uh, and to be able to be there for them when they come back home and their families. And that's what we try to do every day. Uh, this past year, we've had some really important accomplishments. 11 bills that have passed through Congress that the President has signed, uh, all done in a bipartisan way. Um, we have, I always say, the best committees in Congress because they work on the issues. They don't let politics get in the way. They focus on veterans. And because of that, we've done some pretty important things, I think, for veterans. Uh, we're focusing a lot on how we support them. So we have a new family caregiver uh, advisory group, and we're so fortunate Senator Elizabeth Dole has agreed to chair that for us. We've launched a 24-hour-7 veterans hotline that goes into the White House, and that's an important way for us to get information directly to get the support of the White House. As you know, we've expanded our GI Bill now to provide more education benefits. That's happening in your states. That was terrific. We changed the appeals law to modernize it. Last time it was updated was 1933, and uh, we're making important progress there I'll talk about. We're continuing to get our choice program working better, and already we've extended and expanded the amount of support to get veterans care in the community. Uh, I've expanded care, mental health care, to those that other than honorably discharged. What most people may not realize is 
15% of people who leave the service leave with an other than honorable discharge, and they don't have access to health care, particularly mental health care, so we've begun to address that. Uh, the president just signed an executive order that 100% of service members who leave will have mental health care coverage for a 12-month period of time. Only 40% today who leave the service have access to VA health care services, so that's going to be 100%. And we've just released a national ID card for veterans. Uh, but really, we're here to talk about how we can work together better, and that's so important to us to be a better partner to you. We understand your role in caring for veterans is essential. 50% of all veterans across the nation are in your facilities uh, in long-term care. We also know that we can work with you using technology like telehealth to reach into those facilities, and we're beginning to do that. We have about 13 states that now have access to our telehealth expertise clinically, and we want to expand that to give all of you that type of care. The state veteran homes are working with the federal government in important areas to improve safety, like falls initiatives, to prevent falls in your state veterans' homes, and that's something that we think is going to make a big difference. Uh, some states, and I can't name them all, I just don't have the time, like Washington State's working with us where we're putting a clinic right on the state veterans home ground so that we can provide mental health services. And this type of partnership, I think, works really well. And in terms of getting claims faster, Texas and California, but many, many others working with us to get that backlog down. I think you probably know about our work with you in the Veterans Cemetery Program. Uh, we've awarded $766 million to states to help support getting cemeteries. Every single state in the country has a uh, VA cemetery. And some states, uh, I think that there's um, five, no, four states that have five veteran cemeteries, Arizona, Missouri, Maryland, and Maine. We have six more currently under construction uh, throughout the country. And two states this year opened up cemeteries, uh, New Mexico and Mississippi. So uh, the way that this works is, is that if you provide us the land, we will be able to provide you support to develop it, open it, and work with you. So that's an opportunity, I think, uh, for us to all plan ahead. There's 109 of them, as I said. You can see where your state is, how many there are. Uh, but uh, it's a very successful program, this collaboration that we have with you. We're also working with you to end veteran homelessness. Three states have already ended veteran homelessness. More than 50 communities have announced an end to veteran homelessness. Nationally, we've had a close to 50% reduction in the number of homeless veterans uh, over the last five years. But still, we have 45,000 veterans in this country who are homeless. And uh, so we know that the only way we can tackle this is by working closely with local communities and states to work together in a collaborative way. And we are committed. We're putting more money into this in this budget. We're focusing and refocusing our efforts on what we know works and what doesn't work. I don't need to tell you that our veterans are getting older. Uh, the population is getting older. You know that by looking at your own data. Uh, but that means that it's pretty predictable that when people get older, they're going to need our help more in terms of support services. And we've modeled this out that the growth in long-term care and working with you in the states is going to be even higher in the next decade to come. And so we have to do this in a smarter way. The way that we're focused on this is that I've identified five priorities. And I just want to briefly touch on these so you know where we're focusing our efforts and see whether it's also um, hitting on things that you think are important to you, because we may need to make some adjustments. The first of the five priorities is to give our veterans greater choice. And that means that we believe that they should be involved in where they get their care, decisions about where they get their care, and how they get their care, and how they get their services. And we're trying to change our current systems from being very rules-based, administratively based, you need to be 40 miles away, or you have to wait 30 days before you even get access to the ability to get choice, to a more clinically driven system, the type of system that I've run as a CEO in the private sector, where we focus on what's the right thing to do for our patients and our veterans. And so we're working with Congress right now. We have 26 VSOs all supporting us as we work with members of Congress in a bipartisan way to give veterans greater choice. 
The second of the five priorities is to modernize our systems. I was talking to Governor Fallon and she said, you know, our facilities are pretty old and more than 50% of our facilities are 60 years old or more. So we're focused on that. One of the decisions that I just recently made was to scrap our homegrown old uh, electronic health record and select a modern off the shelf electronic record. It happens to be the same one the Department of Defense uses, which looking back in history, we've been trying to do for 17 years, get these systems to talk. And we've spent over a billion dollars getting two systems to talk and we still can't do it. So why don't we just use the system they're using and get to a modern system? And so that's an example of what we're doing. We're trying to modernize our facilities. I was telling Governor Fallon we're trying to do something now in Tulsa like this. But this is a, a facility in Palo Alto. And look, this is the type of facility you and your family want to be in, a place they can stay with you, single rooms, pleasant. Um, we want this for all of our VA facilities. And now we're beginning to do that. For the first time in over three years, Congress worked with us to get 28 new leases out in your communities. We're looking at doing business differently by working with the private sector to build with them, not have federal construction be the only way of building new facilities. We think we can do it faster and cheaper by working with the private sector. I'm also eliminating old and unused buildings. Uh, no sense paying for maintenance of vacant buildings, underutilized buildings. And so I've announced that I have 1,100 or 1,200 vacant and underutilized buildings. We've already eliminated a couple hundred, but we're gonna continue to do that. The infrastructure bill that was recently talked about, while it doesn't have money for VA, it allows us to take the proceeds from what we get rid of and reinvest it in your facilities that we know veterans need to modernize those facilities. So we think that's an important tool. The third of the fifth priorities is to just improve the timeliness of our services. 97% of all of our appointments are completed within 30 days, 86% within seven days, 21% are done on the same day basis. We have established same day services for primary care and mental health in every one of our VA medical center facilities now. So if you have an urgent issue in primary care and mental health, same day, services are available. Uh, we also are the only health system in the country that I'm aware of, and no one's proven me wrong yet, that publishes our wait times. If you go to our website, you can see the wait times of your facilities in your states updated every two weeks in real time. So you can see what those wait times are, whether they're good, bad, uh, need a lot of work to develop. We are sharing that data with our veterans so they have information about how to make choices about their decisions and also so we can focus on improvement. No other health system does this. We do know from data that has been studied that while VA still has access problems in particular locations, overall VA wait times are much shorter than the private sector. And I'm sure you get calls saying, hey, friend, family, sick, can you help me get them an appointment at a, at a place? I mean, we all know that that still is a challenge in the private sector, but VA wait times tend to be up to 40% better than in many parts of the country that struggle with shortages of primary care. We're also doubling down on technology. Uh, nobody is doing more telehealth in this country than the VA. Over a billion dollars a year, 730,000 veterans getting their care through telehealth. I, I'm the first secretary that still practices medicine. Uh, I see patients, and you can see the president and I from the White House, I'm um, talking to one of my patients there on the screen. He's in Grants Pass, Oregon. Uh, I've never been there, but that's where I see patients from my office in Washington. And using our federal supremacy licensing, we are able to use VA clinicians from New York City or Chicago to any part of the country that doesn't have access to super specialists or in my case, I'm a primary care doc, but um, we are using this to be able to address the wait time and access issue. The fourth of the fifth priorities is to make sure that we're focused on the things that are most important for veterans, the things that they really need the VA to be not only good at, but world class at. Traumatic brain injury, PTSD, blind rehabilitation, prosthetics, orthotics, spinal cord injury, the environmental hazards of war. That's what they need the VA to be really, really good at. And so we're focusing our resources to make sure that that's what we're good at. 
And the way we're doing that is we're sharing our quality compared to the private sector. If you go to our website in your communities, you can see where the VA is on standardized quality measures and compare it to your local community to see if we really are better. And we're not always better, quite frankly. That's where we need to focus our efforts to get there. I've announced a moonshot, and this is to make sure that every veteran has the opportunity to stay in their home as long as they want to using technology, using our home-based services, using caregivers, the VA supports caregivers. We want to expand our support for that. But that the home is really an environment where many people want to remain and we want to support our veterans in the way they want to be cared for. We're doing things like focusing our resources on things that matter to veterans. Hepatitis C, veterans have a higher incidence of hepatitis C than the general population. About 18 months ago, there were close to 160,000 veterans with hepatitis C. We are soon, in the next couple months, going to be at 20,000 or less. We are going to be the first system in the country that has targeted this disease and going to eliminate it from the entire population of veterans, everyone who wants to be treated. And that's the way that you focus our resources to make sure that we're doing right things by veterans. Uh, Governor Fallon talked about the opioid uh, crisis. We, are, again, are the only system in the country who publishes our opioid use rates. Uh, I want you guys to get your hospitals and your doctor groups to publish their prescribing rates. VA is doing it. Go to our website. You can click on any one of your sites, any VA, and you can see the opioid prescription rates. I know who the highest in the country is. I know who the lowest in the country is. You guys should know where your VA hospitals are and where your other facilities, because this is really important that we get this right for veterans, but also for all Americans. The fifth and final priority is to prevent suicide. 20 veterans a day taking their life through suicide. It's a number that's unacceptable to you, unacceptable to me. We have to do better. What this slide shows is, I'd be glad to talk to you more about it. If veterans get their care in the VA system, if we can get them to get help, it saves lives. Just take a look at the bottom line, female veterans. Over the last 14 years, if you were a female veteran getting care in the VA system, your rate of suicide went down by 2.6% over those 14 years. If you were a female veteran not getting care in the VA, but out in the community, maybe not getting care at all, unfortunately, your rate went up 81.6%. We can save lives by working together to get people the help they need. When they're isolated and hopeless, we're not doing any good. People are dying every day. Um, if this were cancer and we knew there was a treatment that would help them stay alive, we'd all be out there dialing people, talking, and doing that. We need to be doing the same thing. We have a campaign called hashtag be there, be there for veterans. Tom Hanks is our national spokesperson. We're working with local communities to get that message out to save lives, to prevent suicide. Finally, let me just mention, as we go into budget season, and I'm starting to present the, the president's budget before Congress, this is a strong budget. This is a budget that reflects the president's commitment to doing better for veterans, $198 billion. But this is investing in both improving the infrastructure of the VA, but also giving veterans greater choice out in the community. And I think it's the right balance uh, that is going to be uh, meaningful to veterans. My last slide really is, since we don't have a stock price as a company, uh, I can't track that the way that uh, a corporate organization would. Our stock price, our Dow Jones Industrial Index, if you would, is the trust that veterans have in the VA. It was at a low in 2014 after our wait time crisis in Phoenix of 46%. Today it's at 70%. That's not good enough. We're not happy with that. But it's showing that we're moving in the right direction, that through transparency, like posting our wait times, our opioid rates, our accountability actions, uh, talking about the problems that are significant and real that we have to work on together, that that's a formula for beginning to regain some of that trust. And we're going to stick at this and continue to make progress with all of your help. Uh, I should mention that your feedback to me really does matter. Governor Scott uh, had come to me about a year ago and said, you know, you guys don't make our life easier. You give us money for state veterans' homes, yet it comes with all these rules and regulations. You tell us we have to build the greenhouse model, single rooms, and it costs us a fortune. And 
frankly, just let us do what we think is right. And I eliminated all the federal regulations. We're now using your state regulations. You can build a greenhouse model if you want, but if you think it's better to use your money in a different way, we're following your guidance and rules, and we'll provide you the money to do what you think is right for your citizens. Uh, that was very helpful feedback to me. Um, I don't know all these things that your state directors know or that you know. So please, uh, I hope you understand I am committed to working with you so that together we can do the right thing for the people that have defended us. So thank you very much and glad to take any questions. Let me start, uh, Mr. Secretary. You talk about uh, the financial assistance and we focus on nursing homes. You know, we're looking to increase the number of uh, seniors in, in assisted living as well as keeping them in their homes. I don't know that your financial assistance to the states has kept pace with that trend. Yeah, yeah. You will see that we are trying to, in the president's budget, increase the amount of funding, first of all. Secondly, uh, in talking to some of the state veterans' homes uh, that I did earlier this month, they told me there are things that we can do, like make it easier for you to establish adult daycare programs. Uh, right now, I guess we make it pretty tough. Our regulations prevent you from doing that. But if we can do things like that, we can keep people out of institutions and, and support them in ways that, frankly, we want to take the lead from what you want to do. So we're looking for new ways. We're looking to keep people in their homes where possible. We're looking to support you because there's certain people that just aren't going to be able to remain in their homes, so you're going to have a valuable role there. And we're looking to decrease some of the bureaucracy to allow you to function in a way that you want to function. Thank you. Governor Fallon. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. We appreciate you being here to answer questions. You and I were talking earlier about substance abuse, opioid addiction, and our veterans who, for some reason, may enter into our criminal justice system. And you, you and I were talking about a unique system that you have with the veterans courts mm -hmm. and being able to help those who are incarcerated to be able to have people to be their buddy system as we have in our state. But could you talk about some of the models that you see across the nation that yep. help those who are incarcerated? Well. I, I think we have a very successful model in our veteran treatment courts. We have 342 veteran treatment courts, all located in your communities. And what they do is, as Governor Fallon knows, uh, they try to find alternatives to prison where the, where the crime that has been committed is nonviolent and related, obviously, to either a person's psychiatric or mental condition or a substance or drug abuse. And why put them in the prison when what they really need is treatment? These are often uh, treatable diseases, and so we get them right into, or the judges allow us to get them right into intensive treatments. And this program has shown that the recidivism rate one year after has an 80% reduction. So I think that's not only the right thing to do for veterans, but it's the right thing to do for taxpayers and, and the states that are shouldering that burden. Uh, so we think it's a very successful model. It can be applied outside of um, veterans, of course, uh, but they're working in your communities. We're working to expand that. Uh, even in the prisons, as, as Governor Fallon was talking about, where we cohort veterans together, they seem to decrease the number of problems in the prisons. There's certain order uh, in a cohorted group of people that are used to and understanding each other. So I think there are a lot of lessons as we look towards prison reforms and we look towards uh, getting the right people treatment for addiction that we can learn. And, and we're certainly open to learning more from all of you. Okay, Governor Bevan, got a couple of, couple of quick questions. One, you 1,200 facilities, you're shut down, putting that money back into updating existing in, in those that will maintain. Is there any correlation between they're shut down in a state and the money goes back to that state, or is it sort of an omnibus type approach? That's one question, and then I want to go to Hep C. Yeah. Uh, right now, under current law, the money goes back to the U.S. Treasury. Perfect. Uh, so what the president is hoping to do under the infrastructure law is to allow it to be targeted to help veterans. And if we can get that through, as you know, the infrastructure bill is an idea, not a reality. 
Uh, but if we can get that through, I think then we'd be open to lots of discussions about how we can use that money locally. Outstanding. I also, thank you. I, I wanted to talk to you about the efforts to eradicate hep C mm -hmm. in, the, in the population that you're referring to. That's a fairly audacious uh, undertaking, and yet you seem very confident that you're getting close to doing mm -hmm. so. Can you talk to us about the method to that, the methodology? Was it done uh, initially as sort of a pilot? Uh, specifically, what drugs or drug companies are you working with? Yeah. Uh, I'd just be curious as to yeah. how you've undertaken that. Yeah. Well, um, first of all, uh, what we've done is, and we're doing this also in suicide, we are proactively reaching out. We're not waiting for people to come to us and say, oh, we heard you have a new drug that can cure this disease. Remember, the drugs now have a 95% cure rate. Um, so we, are, we have teams of pharmacists that we've trained, largely pharmacists, that are reaching out to veterans, calling them in, explaining what the options are, and uh, overseeing a compliance program because these are not one-time drugs. You have to use them over a course of a couple months. Um, so I think that's what's different. I've been a doctor a long time. I've run hospitals uh, in some of your states. And uh, we don't usually reach out to people. We wait till they call us, but the VA is reaching out. Um, th when we started this program, there was one drug company, Gilead. Uh, the price was pretty high. Uh, VA does better than anybody else in terms of pricing. But when others have entered the market with a similar type, the prices have dropped. So we now work with and use multiple drug companies. Uh, the prices are less than half of when we started this program, which just allows us to be able to reach out more and, and, and get this done even faster. So um, the interesting thing that we're finding is, is that there is a population of veterans that while they could be cured are choosing not to take the drug. We're trying to understand that. It's sort of like you know what we find in homelessness. Even though we can offer some veterans homes, they want to stay out on the streets. Sm small number, but it's not insignificant. And so we're trying to understand how we can do better with that. And we, of course, share our lessons with the general community, because I think it's going to be a problem in the general community as well. Governor Malloy. Uh, thank you very much for being with us mm -hmm. and uh, uh, sharing some of the data. I, I know on one of the slides uh, you talked about the appeal process and also reviewing uh, files. I, I, I absolutely urge that that be engaged on an ongoing basis. We clearly separated people from um, the military service uh, primarily due to mental health challenges in, in many of those cases. And quite frankly, it's tremendously unfair and, and leads to uh, uh, suicide and, and, and other uh, uh, behaviors. I also want to say I, I, we very much appreciate uh, the assistance. We were the first state to end chronic homelessness in the country, yeah. one of three to end homelessness uh, amongst veterans. Um, and, and of course, that is defined as folks who will access the, the assistance right. you, you, you give. But I will also tell you that we do ongoing outreach to people who refuse to, 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 to take the help. And, and we've had a pretty good rate of um, uh, folks changing their mind. I I do want to touch on the uh, issue of incarcerated uh, veterans uh, and, and share with you, and you may already be aware of it, we, we have opened in our prisons a series of reintegration uh, centers, mm -hmm. uh, one of which is devoted uh, entirely to veterans, really calling upon the best days of their life as they prepare to reenter society. Uh, most of our veterans in the reintegration center uh, spend somewhere between the last six months or last eight to, six to 18 months of their period of incarceration. Uh, and what we are seeing uh, in those in that reintegration center um, is folks who are substantially better prepared to, to reenter a broader society, um, and, and quite frankly, are calling upon um, their experiences that that got them to a level of accomplishment that perhaps they had not seen in a long period of time. In that regard, to the extent that you all could reach out um, uh, on, on an uh, on a bigger basis, I think, to, to uh, corrections officials um, in, in the country. I think that, that would pay big, big dividends. We've seen it in, in Connecticut, and I think uh, it would be um, uh, helpful. The other is, one other point on um, uh, one of the things that we've also done is tried to make sure that no one 
veteran or otherwise leaves prison uh, who's had a, a heroin uh, a problem uh, leaves uh, without access to, to Medicaid, uh, medically assisted um, uh, uh, support. Um, and we also have seen that that's demonstrated uh, great, great uh, results, very different outcomes three months later, six months later, uh, a year later with respect to, to uh, staying out of, uh, out of prison. And I, I think we owe it to our veterans uh, to do everything we can to keep them out of prison. Um, and I urge you to, to reach out to that, uh, that group of commissioners across the United States that are doing some of these things. Yeah. But thank you for your service. Yeah, yeah. I, I really was going to say the same thing to you, Governor, which is um, you know, these types of impressive gains that you've made in your state is really thanking you and your administration because there is no way VA can do this alone. There's no way the states can do this alone. This is, these are community-led efforts that achieve, you know, as you said, what you've been able to do in homelessness and what you're doing in the prisons is really impressive. And to, to my fellow governors, just to, to share one thought, you know, we made it a priority uh, with our local housing authorities to add veterans as a preferred uh, or first service amongst the ser first service uh, groups to, to, to gain housing when it was available. Um, and uh, it was like a, a, you know, a light switch being thrown. I, I, of course people want to do it once they realized uh, that A, you thought they should do it, and B, they could do it. Mm -hmm. um, and a, a good part of what we were, we, we built a lot of additional housing, yep. and that certainly on a, a, you know, building uh, 22,000 units of, or funding 22,000 additional units of housing has helped, but, uh, just highlighting how important it was to the to, to the individual communities and organizations was was a big part of that success as well. Yep. Thank you. Great. We have ten minutes left. I have Governor Wolf, Governor Carney, Governor Walker, and Governor Sandoval all wishing to be recognized. So I ask you to keep your comments brief, and we'll get uh, uh, th through I'll that be, more. I'll be brief. I just want to first of all say congratulations and my compliments to you on your choice of a team. It's a Pennsylvania team, the Eagles. Um, <laughs> But second, uh, we, we do need to, to do our best to honor our veterans once they come mm -hmm. back, and I think that's a partnership that the states and the federal government needs to, to work on. One of the things that, that Governor Fallon pointed out in her introduction mm -hmm. of you was the need to, for states to work together to make sure that, that especially spouses of military folks uh, have, um, uh, we have some coordination of the licensure and certification. Is that an issue that, that you can help us with? Yeah, we're working on that. I think, I think you're absolutely right. Um, you all know this, so I don't want to say something you, that you already know. But, you know, when somebody serves their country, it's not just them. It's their entire family. And the stress that families are under when their spouses are deployed um, is incredible. So we have an obligation, and we are looking at ways to be able to help that. And uh, many of our employment efforts, now that we're at a 2.7% unemployment rate for veterans better than the general population is now helping spouses achieve that uh, meaningful employment as well. So absolutely. Governor Kearney. Thank you, Governor. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. I'm over here. Mm -hmm. uh, appreciate your visit to the Wilmington Medical Center not, mm -hmm. not that long ago and, mm -hmm. and your great work. Uh, I was in Congress when, when we created the CHOICE program. And my, the last update I got was that there was uh, a similar delay in getting folks going through the CHOICE program to get access to those, uh, to those appointments because they had to go through some kind of intermediary. Yes. Could, could you comment on that, pl yeah. please? Yeah. Well, uh, I consider what you did in Congress in response to a crisis for the CHOICE program pretty miraculous. I think it was the right thing to do, and we stood up a program from zero to national 90 days. Uh, but even with as well thought out as it was, we've learned a lot of problems with the program. It's natural. Uh, first thing we learned is we have seven different ways of paying for veterans to go out into the community. That's expensive, complex, no one understands it, especially veterans. So we have a new piece of legislation we're working with both the House and the Senate on to combine it into one program. Secondly, we designed this so that we put a third party, a third party administrator, there are two in the country, HealthNet and TriWest, right in the middle of the veteran and the VA. And not too many businesses I know that stay in business outsource customer service. It just doesn't work. Um, so we're bringing that back in, or at least this is our proposal in Congress, which is we know the veterans. They know and trust their staff. And so what we want to use a third party for are things that we don't do well, 
paying bills, which we don't do well, uh, credentialing and keeping the network up with providers all over the country, we don't do that well. But we really want to be care coordinating and touching our veterans because that's what we're in the business of doing. So we've taken the lessons over the last three years and a lot of problems, and we're working with Congress now to launch a new program. Uh, this is the one the 26 VSOs have all endorsed, and you know our committees are working through their proper processes. Thank you. Mr. Walker. Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary, for your presentation. It was absolutely excellent. <clears throat> I didn't take a picture of your slides. Um, I'd like to get a copy if I sure, could. Sure, of course. One that uh, I've narrowed my five question down to one in terms okay. of time. But, um, you know, we're trying to develop a, a veteran cemetery in Fairbanks. And one of the requirements, we have the land, we have to build okay. a road, but we have to build them to your specifications. And a road in Alaska is a little different than a road in I won't pick out any other urban areas, but yeah. it's just different. Yes. And so is there any waiver <clears throat> potential to have an Alaskan road put in rather than, you, you know? know uh, Governor, um, Senator Sullivan made me come to Alaska, which I was glad to do, to make this point. Unless you're up there and you see and you understand how different it is, uh, you know, it's easy to sit in Washington and just say everyone should be the same. Uh, so I am very open to considering waivers. Very good. I, I just need you to tell me what you need me to do. Thank you. I mean, because I don't know what you know. So let's work together on that. I want to see you. You're not going to recommend something if it's not the right thing. Right. Uh, so we're not here to second guess you. We're here to support you. And we'll do that. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Understandable. Thank you. And thank you, Ms. Secretary, for mm -hmm. being here. I'll be very quick. If you could expand quickly on the opportunities for assisted living, particularly with the aging veterans so that they could stay at their homes. Yeah. And second, um, extending you an invitation. We're opening a new veterans home in Reno, Nevada in December of this year, and it would be really a privilege and honor if you could Great. attend. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you mm -hmm. for that. Um, this moonshot of trying to help veterans and, frankly, all Americans be able to remain in their home if that's their choice to do, which, you know, I don't have too many patients who say, Doc, you know, help me find a nursing home. Um, I think we're at a breaking point right now that we can do this. So with remote monitoring capabilities, with telehealth into people's homes, sometimes or more often on their mobile phones or their iPads, uh, with home care visits like VA does, we have home directed primary care teams that go into homes. Home, home specialty care, aid and attendance systems, and caregivers. Remember, the VA supports 27,000 caregivers right now that can stay with veterans in their homes. Even animals, right? Dogs are super important for mobility and now emotional support issues. There are ways that we can build a system around our veterans and let them remain in the settings that they want. I think it's cheaper, I think it's better, um, and we're going to take it as a moonshot. We're not there right now, but I think we can do it together. We'd like to work with all of you. That's why I've been talking to your, your directors and your state veterans' homes about doing this together. That's where they said, look, help us clean up adult daycare because that's part of the solution. So we want to be a partner with you in it, but I think we'd be doing a good thing and then leading away for the rest of Americans who deserve the same. So. Great. Mr. Secretary, thank you very, very much. Thank uh, we you. Have thank you very much. And I ask Governor Fallon to make any closing remarks, and then uh, Governor Malloy has a resolution he wants to present. Well, I think we heard some great information about what the Veterans Affairs missions are and what their priorities are to help our states, and hopefully they heard some great comments from our governors on how we can work together. I think we had a great start. Thank you. Governor Malloy. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, many of us have had the privilege of both knowing and working General Tim Lohenberg, uh, who passed away unexpectedly this past summer. Among his many distinctions, the general was the former Adjutant General of, of Washington State and one of the founding fathers of the Council of Governors, in which uh, uh, Governor Fallon and myself have had the privilege of, of uh, heading. Uh, he was in instrumental in the creation of the dual status commander uh, and in establishing the National Guard as a cyber workforce. Uh, Force, I should say. He was also an active voice for uh, defending the Guard from dramatic cuts to uh, force structure and, uh, and 
to support uh, structural and uh, operational capabilities. Anyone who had the privilege of working with him can attest to the impact that the general had on the National Guard in ensuring uh, in sh uh, its uh, continued st strategic and operational importance uh, in our nation's defense. Uh, during the Council of Governors meeting on Friday, we approved a resolution honoring the life of, of the general, and I bring it before this body and ask for your consideration. It reads in part, uh, General Lohenberg's uh, service was exemplary, and he continues to be widely praised by governors, their staff, and the National Guard community. General Lohenberg supported the state of Washington as adjutant general um, and homeland security advisor for 14 years, helped to establish the Council of Governors, and supported the National Governors Association as a consultant after his retirement from the military. General Lohenberg truly honored the model of service over self throughout his long service uh, to the nation. Uh, I now, uh, uh, I would now offer that as a motion uh, and, and ask that we approve the resolution. Any, dis second? Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion prevails. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Anything else for the committee? All right, we're, we're adjourned, thank you.